restaurant. Um, it is my distinct pleasure to introduce Finn Rooney and his senior project. Um, Finn um, actually knew exactly what he wanted to do from the moment um, he walked into the senior project in January and um, never really wavered, but um, learned a ton and was able to modify things based on what he learned, which I have to say I was super impressed by. Often people come into senior project with one idea and they are gonna stick with that idea no matter what. And Finn was like, oh yeah, I could do that. Um, and so he was able to take his ideas, modify them really well, and came out with a product um, that I think he can be truly proud of. So um, I present Finn Rooney. Thank you for coming, everyone. Uh, my presentation is Electric Entertainment, the effects of nonviolent video games versus violent video games on the human brain. So, just as an introduction, I chose this topic because I like video games. Yeah, it's simple, really. And I like video games of m many different genres. And when I get towards my thesis here, I wanted to in uh, investigate sort of why, sorry, how nonviolent versus violent video games affect the human brain in order to alleviate biases and misconceptions that could paint video games poorly, such as classifying them as wastes of time or that they cause violence in the world. And on that same idea of violence, it's important to clarify what I mean when I say violence in terms of this presentation, because while we have the Oxford language's definition of violence there on the right, I also wanted to go into the more specifics and say that what I, what I considered violent for this project was any game that contains elements of blood, gore, gratuitous violence, which would be something like Mortal Kombat, and uh, as well just in general, one or more characters wanting to do harm to someone or something. So getting into the baselines of things, as you can see, we've got Pong on the top there, one of the, considered one of the first video games. And on the bottom there is a game called Red Dead Redemption 2. Both are video games, and for the longest of time, video games have been entertaining, plain and simple. No matter what genre you have, you're going to want to succeed in a video game, and that could come across in many different ways. In Minecraft, you could build a house, and cool, you built your house. Or you could slay the final boss in, in another game. Either way, when you succeed, you receive dopamine and serotonin. Woohoo! You did it. Your brain is happy. And when you get those happy chemicals, your brain's gonna wanna do that again in order to get that same feeling. That's how games motivate. When we're motivated to do something, we're gonna wanna do it more. And that will get into more moderation versus addiction later down the line, but that in general is how video games motivate us. As well, humans learn by play. It's just something natural that we do. And when we're playing a video game, there are four areas of the brain that are used. In terms of cognition and memory, we have the hippocampus, prefrontal cortex, or sorry, the frontal cortex, and the cerebellum. That deals with memorizing how to do things, muscle memory and such. And then as well, you've got the amygdala, which relates to an idea called the picture superiority effect, and how the brain will take in visual information and is actually better at storing that visual information than, say, hearing most of the time. And as well, in general, video games are excellent social outlets for team play and collaboration, regardless of the genre. So now, it was important to establish that baseline because both violent video games and non-violent video games actually have a lot of similarities when it comes to the brain chemistry. But what I'm going to be going into on these next slides is how one genre might do it better, do something better than another genre. Starting with violent video games, I actually found that when I was conducting my research that violent video games can actually have a cathartic effect for those who play them, meaning that you might be angry walking in or starting to play a video game and then walking away from that game, you might actually feel less angry. It can be a completely healthy outlet to get rid of any negative or possibly violent thoughts that you do have. As well, violent video games are oftentimes more intensive for skills like reaction time, spatial awareness, and muscle memory. You have to hear where the enemy is, when they turn the corner, you have about half a second to do something before something bad could happen to you. Something very interesting that I did find in my research as well is that in a lot of the studies conducted, there was an increase, a noticed increase in verbal aggression, but not physical aggression. And there is still research being done on why this link could exist, but possible factors that exist right now could be something like adrenaline of the game or something more extreme such as uh, home life that could be consistently verbally abusive. 
And as well, an important thing when getting into the idea of real violence versus fake violence is something in the brain called the anterior cingulate cortex, or the ACC. And it's, what, it's the part of our brain that deals with dreaming. And it's how we can say, uh, okay, so yeah, that violence that's taking place on screen, if, it, if it's a documentary, we could say, okay, yeah, this is, this is real. Or if it's a video game, we can still know in our brain that it's fake. And in general, violent video games as well are more intensive for mechanics over content. You've got a lot of buttons to memorize what does what, where, what goes where when you're playing a game, as opposed to, say, Minecraft, just memorizing a crafting recipe to build your house, or a math game to just answer a math question. And as well, violent video games also prevail in the areas of team strategy. You collaborate as a team, oftentimes with strangers, hopefully in a friendly manner, where you can <laughs> collaborate to take down the other team. Moving on to nonviolent video games, examples can include uh, educational games, simulations, or just generally games that don't have the violent elements that I clarified earlier in the presentation. But nonviolent video games also have less action that can have, might have, as well have less adrenaline and be considered more at your own pace. The example I gave for the nonviolent video game where an enemy turns the corner and you have maybe at max half a second to figure out what to do. In Minecraft, those time limitations still exist, but you've got about 10 minutes to do something before something bad happens to you. And as the inverse of violent video games, concepts will prevail over mechanics. In Brain Age, on the right there, all, you'd be, all you're pretty much doing is filling out a Sudoku puzzle or drawing in a math, uh, the answer to a math question, as opposed to, in a violent video game, having seven different button combinations that you have to remember what does what. Now, exceptions do exi exist to this. Uh, one, two of my favorite games, Osu and Rocket League, are incredibly in, uh, intensive for reaction time. Osu being a rhythm-based game where you have to be spot on if you want a good score. And in Rocket League, it's very great for team strategy as well as fast paced. I used to be on the esports team and we played it. It was an incredibly competitive experience. As well, nonviolent video games can also prevail in terms of learning ideas over topics. One really interesting study that I read up on while doing my research in China was a study done on a group of third graders where half of a group of third graders read about firefighting tactics on a computer screen, just wall of text, where another group played a firefighting game. Both contained the same amount of information. And it was found that in three out of four of the tests that the those who played the uh, firefighting game were able to retain the information better. The fourth test was found to have no change, but the source of error was found to most likely come from the fact that third graders might have been seeing images that they could not recognize on the matching portion of the test. So getting into my product, since I had technically two parts to my, uh, to my research, nonviolent and violent, I wanted to do the same to my product as well. So for my, the non, uh, for the violent video game portion of my product here, I have ESRB modifications. The ESRB is the Electronic Soft, sorry, Entertainment Software Rating Board, if I remember that correctly. And I wanted to rework the classifications that they have for games uh, in order to give a more holistic look. When I flip over a game, I want to be able to know more than just blood and intense violence in a game. It doesn't really paint it in such a good manner. So in my rework here, don't get me wrong, I still think that those games, should, those games should have those kinds of classifications if they contain those elements. I think that's still important. This game, by the way, is kind of straight global offense as a, uh, a popular first person shooter. So what I've also added to it is it could contain gambling elements. I then put a line in order to separate what could be considered bad with what could be considered good. It could also be great for reaction time building, spatial awareness, and team strategy. So by doing that, when I flip over a game, I could have a better idea of what a game is if I'm hearing for it, if I'm hearing about it for the first time. Then finally, I actually created a warning label. Uh, those who have disorders such, such as uh, what's it, such as schizophrenia or antisocial personality disorder, which is the clinical term for sociopathic behavior, could really benefit from maybe not playing violent video games. If they have trouble with their ACC, that means that they would have trouble differentiating what's real and what's fake a lot of the time. So this warning label I have on the lower right there could appear when buying on the back of a game as a sticker or even appear when you're booting up the game every time, just as a warning that 
it may not be good for them to play that kind of game if they have trouble differentiating real from fake. And for the second part here, I created an educational game to showcase how games motivate by giving the user goals to work towards, customization options where they can personalize their, their player. And as well, the target audience for this game was people who are just getting started with calculus so they can showcase how we learn through play and practicing basic calculus formulas or basic concepts. I had to, uh, I had to actually tap out of this in order to play the video. Go. Uh, I'm going to be pausing this a few times, just a little bit here, but I won't play it all in the interest of time. So right here, these first two are what I want to focus on. I have a whole slide dedicated to the thank yous as well. But I did borrow one script for the coding of this project in the essence of time. I wanted to focus on the application more than the coding, So I want, but I did want to still code as practice. I want to become a game designer when I grow up, so I don't want to just completely copy the whole thing. But I did, uh, I did borrow that one script from a YouTube channel called Brackies, how I learned basics of working in a 2D environment in a program called Unity. And then as well, in general, if I had questions about libraries and just what was built into the game, I would go to the Unity directory, and as well as a for popular coding forum called Stack Overflow. Again, not to copy code, but to wonder what a built-in feature would do for the game. So continuing, let's see if I can, okay, so here we are in the game, you this little blue cube, you can move around. You answer the question, what is the derivative of 2x to the fourth? I don't expect everyone to know that, it's 8x to the third. And if you get that wrong, <laughs> it would help you out with a tip on the screen. But the bridge is out, I've answered the question correctly, you can go on ahead, congratulations. <laughs> the thing is, we didn't complete it in time, so we only get one star out of three. So I continue on with the game. Right here, I fall. Oh, no, I skipped forward. I fell, but I could restart. I answer that question, go on to the next level, etc., etc. I finish the game. It's a, not a very long game, as you can tell. <laughs> I can go to the shop. I have seven stars. All these options, look at them. I equip the yellow option, and I go back to the first level. I only got one star on that one out of three. I answer the question again. I know it, cash, money. I can go back, get full credit. Wait for it. A burger. You can become a burger. So that just showcases how you can have something to work towards and how you could be motivated to maybe try level again in order to practice just to get a better score on something. Let me go to present again. That's there we go. So, final thoughts. What this all means is that while nonviolent video games and violent video video games can have a lot of similarities, some genres will do some things better than others. In terms of violent video games, we, it, it can now be known that the an, anterior cingulate cortex, or the ACC, allows us to differentiate real from fake. That being said, doesn't mean you can't still find things scary. Things can still be, you can still have preferences, just like with horror movies or roller coasters. Things can still spook you, even though you know you're safe. As well with uh, the brain and video games, it's very intricate. and. What I noticed with a lot of my research is that a lot of uh, few, a, a lot of studies were neglecting external factors that could be potentially influencing these results. So it's very nuanced, and it needs to be a lot of factors need to be taken in when studying the brain and video games. And in terms of moderation versus addiction, these results could completely change on someone who plays for 12 hours on end a day, and it would be unrealistic to say that these effects would be uh, amplified in every shape of the imagination as well. Because on my research, I was looking at uh, studies in, that were testing in blocks of 30 minutes, an hour, or two hours even, not 12. So it is important to take that into account as well. And finally, video games, as well as brain science, it's a massive field. There's always new revelations coming out every day, as well as video games are becoming more realistic with things like VR. So it would be really interesting to revisit this in about 10 years and see if this information still holds up as things become more realistic in entertainment. So with that, we've reached the end. I would like to give massive thank yous to my parents, you know, raising me for 18 years. No. Um, Evan Engel Newman, who is my outside advisor for this project and uh, really helped me uh, and guided me along the way of creating this product. Ms. Mortensen, you really pushed me to do my best work and I'm really thankful for that. My fellow cohort members also providing me excellent feedback and making sure that I'm putting forth my best effort. 
Baylin uh, Senate and Casey Holt, both, uh, I, I wanna give a thank you to them for allowing me to interview them in the fields of app design and game design, respectively. I learned a lot and those are fields that I want to go into someday. Finally, Mr. Senate, uh, being incredibly helpful in our Unity class, if I ever ran into an issue running the Unity program, which was how I created the game itself. So, yeah, thank you. So uh, for those on the stream who didn't hear, you might not have heard that question was about real versus fake in terms of VR. And I actually did not look into that. Uh, looking back, if I were to do this project again, that would definitely be something to look into because having something right in front of your face completely isolated like that, that would be something extremely interesting to look into. Uh, I, I would imagine that it would definitely be its own field though, because again, sort of blocking off you're limiting your senses as if you were playing on a computer screen. Yes? Uh, I noticed in all your examples, the non-map video games tend to not look as realistic as the map video games. Do you think that plays a role in some of that, um, like, beneficial factors of each type of game? Mm -hmm. So the question was whether, for the uh, violent video games, a lot of the times they would be more realistic than the non-violent video games. Uh, and uh, the person wanted to know how that related to, uh, sorry, what, what, how it related to? Like how, what that has to do with just the popularity of the games mm -hmm. and the effects of the games on the brain. Uh, and how it has to do with popularity as well as the effects on the brain for the game. And it, that, that's something pretty interesting. I guess I hadn't really noticed that, but um, I, I, yeah, I would probably say that it's that realism that might maybe affect the brain more as, as the field expands, maybe 8K games come out and things become extremely lifelike. Uh, so I think, yeah, the, the, the idea that violent video games often look more realistic could maybe affect that as well. Mr. Vice Pants. You mentioned games and like reaction time and spatial awareness and teamwork as opposed to violent video games and sports video games. Do you find any research that shows that those are applicable in the real world, that we're not just training our reaction time for that game, but then we can use that for something else that would actually might be more beneficial for real world stuff? Mm. So the question was uh, regarding how uh, reaction time, spatial awareness, if those skills could carry over from a violent video game into the real world. And while I actually could not, I was quite, uh, quite bummed because I couldn't find research to that specific degree. Um, and I, I, I would say though that one, one uh, research paper that I did read up on was about how mil the military would use uh, simulations in order to educate their uh, recruits on mechanics, weapon, rep weaponry, as well as strategies that they use. So unfortunately, there's not an exact answer to that question. Uh, I myself really wish there was as well, but. Well, well, um, super interesting. I love the game. Um, I've heard it was cool. Um, <laughs> look at all our research at all on um, like motives within a game. So like, like I grew up in Mortal Kombat, super violent. Um, you know, you have like uh, the Call of Duty series, right? Where like you're ostensibly fighting for good, I think. I've never really played it. But you have like Grand Theft Auto, where Learning about the city and your ability and doing all sorts of crazy things is kind of acting as a medium, I guess, in society. Or um, is, there any, is there anything that can appear on that? Like, what does motive have to do with what the effect on the brain? Does that make sense? Yeah. So the question was relating to motive within video games, such as Grand Theft Auto, you play as a criminal, uh, whereas in other games you could be always the good guy. And to that, I would most likely say, from the research that I conducted, I could not find anything. I was using JSTOR as well as Google Scholar, and I could not find anything directly addressing that question. Um, 
from the research that I did conduct from the brain science of things, I'd say that there would not be that much of a difference with that uh, ACC being the ability, having the ability to regulate the open space. Plus, it would be kind of difficult for me to go conduct a high scale bank heist with a helicopter <laughs> as, a, as a person. <laughs> Yes, Logan. Um, so I'm curious if you looked into the soundtrack of video games at all, because I know for when you have the, the Doom logo up there, and I know personally, like the Doom soundtrack really means the game to me. And I was just curious if you looked into how the soundtrack um, could affect your response to the survivor from the video game or not, or whatever. So I didn't look into that directly, but I did, from the papers that I had read, I did accumulate from as well my background knowledge. It, yeah, video game, uh, sorry, the question was uh, relating to video game soundtracks and how that influences the play of the game. And I would say absolutely. Uh, common strategies that I like read about in, in game is like the soundtrack keeps you focused. And it also oftentimes will fit the mood of a game. And uh, so yeah, I, Sorry, I, I was trying to remember. So, it didn't come directly from my research paper. Uh, it was mainly from my background research before the official research. And it, it, there, there really isn't an influence in like how violent that would make you, just mainly keeping you focused on the game and keeping, like I guess, the themes of the game consistent with the soundtrack would be the answer to that. Um, but. Super interesting question, though. Sam, one last question. Got it. Sam. So, um, you do say that, like, you know, actors are So on the idea of inspiration, that would it would be important to contextualize that person's mental state when it comes to the inspiration by violent video games. Because with the ACC, humans can differentiate real from fake, and we as that as well helps us to regulate what would be socially acceptable, aka like not killing people. So in terms of being inspired by things in, in violent video games, it, it would really come down to the mental health of the person specifically, because by and large, humans will not be, uh, I guess, motivated to in uh, imitate that if, if, they, if they have a properly functioning ACC. So, thank you.